and we are almost live. We are live. Thank goodness. How, how does it feel to be alive? It beats the alternative. Exactly. So <laughs> you've got Mel with a stellar rock star individual today, uh, Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor, whom uh, I'm sure everyone knows from her very famous uh, TED talk. Um, how many years has it been, Jill? Uh, 13, that was 08. Yeah, the a first TED talk, that first one that ever went viral. A stroke of insight. And I'm guessing that probably almost 30 million people have seen it already. Oh yeah. And uh, if you haven't seen it, then shame on you. Uh, Jill, so um, it's great to see you again. We met uh, in Edinburgh TED Summit two years ago and uh, you blew me away uh, then with your with your insight and your personality and i was actually lucky to grab a coffee with you which isn't so easy at ted because you don't have to pay for the coffee but you sure have to line up yeah that's true we all drink way too much caffeine there so you gave a talk there in front of i don't know three or four hundred people um on the brain and everybody talks about two brains. Yes. And you talked about four brains. And I came away and I said, wow. Like, you know, you pay thousands of dollars, many thousands of dollars to go to these TED events. And if you're lucky, something changes the way you look at, at life. Yes. So you changed the way I look at life. Nice. And, and we're here to celebrate your new book. So Thanks. you can, so please talk for a couple of minutes for people who don't know about the four brains, the four characters, and your new book, which is called Whole Brain Living. And it's amazing, it's evocative and provocative. And there's some humor in there. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So um, so thank you, Mel. And um, uh, that was, uh, Ted was gracious enough to let me have an audience to try out some of the new uh, material and um, when I I'm a I'm a speaker really I'm not a book author so I have to talk it a lot before I know what am I going to write because I don't want to sit and write I want to go play and so so I need to have an idea in the beginning about what am I going to write so there are a few fundamental myths that are incorrect about the brain and they have set our thinking in a way that that isn't really creative and reality based. So one is that we only use 10% of our brain. That's simply not true. Neurons are neurons. They're very social creatures. So if there's a neuron, it's in your head, it's alive, it's doing something. Now we may not have a clue about what it's doing, but when you stop and you think that this collection of cells creates our perception of reality and that we are a living being in relationship not only with the external world but with other human beings we're pretty sophisticated collection of cells so um i'm gonna say if it's alive and it's in your head you're using it the other primary myth is that the left hemisphere is our rational thinking brain and it is true that a portion of the brain is our rational thinking brain but the right hemisphere we have said is our emotional brain and that's simply not true the emotional system the limbic system the cells making up we have two amygdala two hippocampi two anterior cingulate gyri these groups of cells of the limbic system are evenly divided between the two hemispheres so we have two emotional systems one in each hemisphere and we have two thinking brains one in each hemisphere so that is that's the division of taking the left brain is thinking and the right brain is feeling to know we have feeling in both hemispheres and thinking in both hemispheres. So then what is the primary difference between those two hemispheres is that the, the left hemisphere filters all the information coming in on the focus of me, the individual. There's a group of cells in the parietal region of the left hemisphere that defines the boundaries of where I begin and where I end. So I can define me as an individual. And then the left hemisphere has language. So language thinks linearly across time. So the left hemisphere defines me, the individual, and it gives me, the individual, a past and a future experience. 
Well, the past nor the future is reality. Reality is what is in the present moment right here, right now experience. And that's the domain of the right hemisphere. So the right hemisphere is all about right here, right now. What is the feeling experience of the present moment? What is the humidity in the air right now? What does it feel like to have my glasses on my face? Um, what, what just, uh, and, and it doesn't define me, the individual. So I become open and expansive and my consciousness shifts into the collective whole of humanity because I am atoms and molecules in vibration with all the atoms and molecules in vibration all around me in the present moment, <clears throat> excuse me. And the present moment without the judgment of me in relationship to it, defining what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. Without that, the present moment simply is the present moment. And it's a peaceful, beautiful place to be and time to be. So we have these two very different hemispheres. And then we have some 300 million axonal fibers running between the two hemispheres so that they are knitted together inside of a single head. And I gain then the perception that I am a single individual and that everything is all about me. So, uh, Jill, um, you had the uh, unique experience. Um, I won't say fortunate, unfortunate. It just is the way it is, right? Of uh, actually living and and coming back miraculously from 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 a stroke that actually shut down the, the left hemisphere of your brain. Yeah. And 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 to boot, you're a PhD. In your own anatomy. In their own anatomy, right. Well, so, the, the Jews would say that that's, that's Michigan. That's what? What's the word? Mich Michigan, that's crazy. Yeah, it is but, crazy. Yes. So I, um, uh, yes, so I was trained as a neuroanatomist. Um, I was teaching and performing research at Harvard Medical School and School of Dental Medicine. And I was teaching head and neck. And so I think in terms of cells, I think in terms of which cells are communicating with which other cells, with which chemicals, in what quantities of those chemicals, and what is the neurocircuitry of every ability that we have. So I kind of understand and look at a human based on how the neurocircuitry is wired for me to hear, for me to see, for me to speak. Uh, I think in terms of neurocircuitry. So on the morning of the stroke, it was a major hemorrhage in the left hemisphere of my brain. I was 37 years old at the time. So I was in the prime of my life at Harvard. And my research was, it was the subject was, how does our brain create our perception of reality? How does this brain take all this data, organize it in these circuits, and then manifest a perception of, me in relationship to the external world. And I studied that because I have a brother diagnosed with schizophrenia and our realities are completely different. So I kind of was the perfect person at the perfect time in the perfect place with the perfect education and the perfect credentials to go through this experiment, if you will, of having a hemorrhage, lose half the hemisphere, all the hemisphere of my left brain and shift into the consciousness of the right here right now present moment and 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 then it took eight years for me to ha experience surgery have them the doctors remove a blood clot the size of a golf ball off of that left hemisphere and then it took eight years for me to recover each of those circuits and my identity as jill bolte taylor because i lost her along the way as that left hemisphere went offline in order to rebuild my ego and my identity in the based on those cells in order to become a whole brain again so um that is, it's been about 25 years since your stroke i should be having a party soon I, well <laughs> hey this is the party i love it i love it thank you lahai lahai love it perfect and, and um and, and and this was the basis of, of your of your talk at TED yes. and uh, and your book that was a bestseller, a huge bestseller um, yes. shortly thereafter, uh, yes. A Stroke of Insight, right? 
My stroke um, of insight. Yeah. Yes. And I call it a stroke of genius, but you know. Thank you. <laughs> and 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 uh, so I have a bunch of questions. I'm ready. Are, are, are you? Do you consider yourself the same person that you were before no. the? Are you're you're a changed person. Do you ask yourself, "Am I changed because of some difference in physiology, pathology, anatomy, or just that I grow?" Um, I'm different because um, a different part of my brain, my right brain, has a different set of priorities and values than my left brain. So the left brain is all about me, the individual. And so me, the individual, has to sit inside and conform to a societal norm. And the societal norm has a hierarchy. So we have a president, we have the people, we have children, schools have hierarchy. Our society is built on hierarchy. And where do I fit at, on every subject? How, what is my education? What is my pay scale? What is my responsibility? What is my size of my house? What is all that hierarchy? Because it's really about how do I fit inside of that bigger picture? So that's the value structure of the left brain. How do I get more in order to climb that hierarchical ladder in order to have a bigger house, in order to have a bigger this, or in order to have get ahead of you, in order to earn more than you earn, or to get more education than you have? So it's all about me against you. It's competitive. Mm -hmm. And the right hemisphere doesn't have that value structure at all because it doesn't care about me, the individual. It cares about we, humanity, the collective whole in relationship to this planet and what is our relationship with one another. And so why would I compete against you? Why wouldn't I nurture you and support you and love you and be kind to you and, 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 and all of us as equal? It's the left brain that then comes in and says, but you're different from me, Mel because you look different you have different hair color you have you're you are different gender you you speak a different language you eat different different foods and 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 you know you're different from me and so the left brain comes in and says well well you're different from me so i'm going to push you away where the right hemisphere comes in and says says um we are one and you are what are our similarities what do we have in common and what are our differences? And I'm interested and curious about those differences instead of, of push away with my fear of those differences. So Jill, when I heard your talk in Edinburgh about two, two and a half, two, two years ago, and two years ago. Two or three, yeah. No, it was two years and one month. Oh, uh, was it? Just, just before the mess that we're in. And, okay. Um, and you know, at the beginning of your talk, you were you were vivacious and, and funny, and talked about things like writing poems, yeah. and uh, and then about after about five minutes, you went into your what we call now in your book, uh, the whole brain living character one. Yes. And it was like, don't bother me. I'm on a linear track now. I'll finish yes. talking. Yes, I'm busy now. Yeah, and then I'll and then you can ask me questions. <laughs> and and I thought that's you know that's it's 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 remarkable. You know, you're talking about what you are. But then yeah. afterwards, when we had coffee, you uh, reverted into more of a character three. Um, yeah. And it was wonderful. And um, you talked two years ago about the four brains. Yes. And, and that bothered me um, because, shall I tell you why it bothered me? Oh, absolutely. Because I'm left-handed. Uh-huh. So. You, you know, my right brain uh, and yeah. my left brain are different than most people's. I don't yeah. know how. I'm a microbiologist, not a neuroscientist. Yes. Um, and then you've, you've, your book has evolved. And I love yeah. this idea that you now have four characters. Each yeah. character is based on a brain. Yeah. But you, you don't go so far as to say this is exactly where it happens. Because there's so much crosstalk in the corpus so, awesome. Yeah, let's Espe first especially with left-handed people. No, that's uh that's so so um so this is what we believe to be true about left-handedness. Left-handed. So so the way the motor system works is that the opposite hemisphere controls the opposite hand. Okay? 
So what you're saying is if you're left left hemisphere dominant, now you would be more right brain dominant and because your language would be over there, but that's not true. In by far the majority, and I can't give you a number, but it's like 98% of people who are left-handed are still have their language in the left brain. And so you have to look at the brain and say, okay, what do we know about the brain? Well, we know we have language centers, the ability to create sound, dog, dog is a sound. And then another group of cells places meaning for comprehension on that sound dog. So that language center in most uh, left-handers is still in the left hemisphere. Okay, so you would think we're completely reversed because... No, 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 I didn't say that. I just okay. said that left-handed okay. left left -hand people have to have a lot more crosstalk. Well, between, yes, you do. You absolutely the, between, do. Between the language center on the left, which I acknowledge. Exactly. And the language slash motor. Exactly. Slash, and, and also re with regarding right. speaking. Speaking is also a bit yeah. for left-handed people. But yeah. what I, I, I want and to... And, you know, has anybody ever really studied the intellect of left-handers? Every left-hander I know is, like, amazingly smart. I know all the left-handers love me now. But it's true because you're still going from the left hand, but to get to the language, you have to go into the right brain, which gives you the big picture, and then send that over the language centers in the left hemisphere. Exactly. So, so by nature, there is this more, this higher inclination to be more naturally whole brain. Ah, okay. And we didn't even talk about learning piano. Like when yeah. left-handed kids learn piano. Oh my God. You know, Jill, I once bit my piano. That was my, my, my second character biting my piano. Never again, never again. Anyway, so I- I'd Oh, like that's to... interesting. And so you really had a difficult time placing um, meaning on an abstract, uh, the abstraction. How old were you when you learned your piano? I started when I was eight. I, I became, I'm a good piano player. I, I, I'm yeah. a prof professional. Well, you would be because, because you would have to do it. You have to invoke your intuition. Yeah. You know, music is not just hitting the right notes, right, in the right order. I mean, that's, that is a form of music, but that's not, that's the, you have to interpret then what, what those notes are. You have to add meaning so, and feeling and experiential so that the audience feels it with you. They're, they're not just listening to you pound a bunch of notes. Okay. I want to come back to music. All right. Okay. So I don't, I, what, what, what maybe some of the people don't understand is that your brain based characters one two three and four so maybe just a sentence i will tell you what i understood from your book and your lecture okay, okay go ahead so character one would be the rational forward thinking uh career driven me yes okay. details details more details yeah. about those details and, then, and, and i'm yeah. in charge and, and that is that is based mostly in the left uh, yes. um, frontal brain okay yes. uh, and then we have uh, character two who's in the left-handed left-sided amygdala for the most part yes not totally yeah who who is the petulant um, complaining remembers yes. every injustice ever done to you and if you're Jewish worries for the past 3,005 years, any <laughs> injustice ever done to the Jewish people since Abraham. Yes, sadly, that is true. And, yes. and always reminding you of it. Yes. My, I call my, my first brain Dr. Mel. Yes. And my second brain is kosher. Because <laughs> he's the one that makes sure I keep kosher, even though I don't believe in it. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Then, yes. we have, then we have the third you know, which, which would be my children's book writing Mel or my inventor yeah. Mel, which, yeah. which is because it's not about you. It's about how do I take reality outside of me now and rearrange it without the right, wrong, good, bad into something new Yeah, in the moment, but having fun. Exactly. Being, being curious. Yes. And, 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 and that, that is, that and is 
and being connected to others. It's it, the first one and second one are being in charge of, and the second, the third one is in in connection with others. So children, how do you touch the lives of children yeah. in a meaningful way? But Jill, this, this is if I call this my five year old brain, would that be okay yeah. with you? Well, you have two five-year-old brains. The character two, uh, worry, uh, fearful, fear-based, angry, blames others, uh, discontent. That's also not a mature part of who we are. That's okay, but that petulant, kosher brain knows that I'm 69 years old. Yeah. So he's he's a five-year-old, temper tantrum, miserable yeah. little kid of a Mel. Yes. But he knows that I'm 69. Yes. Yes, he does. Character three doesn't give a shit. But no, it doesn't at all. He's, That's he's, true. He's really living the moment. Let's write he's, a book, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and we'll, give, we'll give it away. Yeah. Uh, and then, so... <laughs> and so, we'll give it away. Yes, exactly right. And we'll give it away. Yeah. Just get the content out there. Help people get it. Yeah, I'm with you. And then there's yeah. character four, which yeah. I, I, I have to be frank with you. It's the yes. character that I, I don't understand. That yeah. is the um, ecumenical, uh, Protestant, um, God-loving, uh, human, humanity-loving, universe-loving, tree-hugging um, character that I, I don't understand. Maybe I got it wrong. Yes. So all of those things you made as in, defined as in relationship to something. And there is nothing. It is blank. It's like the blank slate. It's like it's like the blue sky that's always blue, regardless of what the weather that comes in front of it. It's always there. There's no judgment. It just simply exists. And the consciousness, I mean, because really what we're talking about here is consciousness. We have groups of cells that organize and a single cell, a neuron designed to communicate and create if I'm a neuron and you're a neuron, then together we know more. And together we have more surface area to receive stimulation from others so that we can know what others know as well. So we are building a consciousness on top of whatever was, whatever is. And when you consider that that single cell in the womb that gets formed, that zygote cell, that first Mr. Microbiology, the zygote cell with half from mom and half from dad, boom, now we have a cell. And that cell has the molecular genius, but it's not gonna be like, okay, now you gotta do this and you gotta do that. It's gonna happen automatically and very quickly up to a rate of 250,000 new cells per second. So there is a ball of energy, a consciousness, energetic, directing and creating this formation of this multicellular form of life in the womb. And whatever that energetic is, whatever that consciousness is, that is fueled by the consciousness of all that is. So we don't, we, it's, it, it's like we have to forget everything that we know in the other consciousnesses in order to relax ourselves back into that level of consciousness where we're not attached to any detail. We're not attached to any separation of anything or any boundary between anything. We just experience an overall feeling of grace and gratitude that we exist at all. And I truly believe that as the cells at the time of death, as our cells shut down in me, the individual, my left brain goes offline and I shift completely into the present moment as the cells of my character three, which has an impetus for doing, let me be innovative, let me be creative, let me share with Mel, let us do something, take that away and we dissipate back into this consciousness that that is and it is within us to be able to feel so when we meditate or when we pray and we feel our ourselves become expansive and it's not about the details and and all the details of me as we open and expand into that that just oh my gosh we're alive mel oh my gosh we're this organic creation of cellular life what the heck is cellular life i mean 
I mean, it's an it's a miracle and an impossibility that a single celled organism exists, much less one made up of some 50 trillion highly refined and differentiated cells that allow us to be life. And we get so caught up with the details of the external that we really stop thinking and connecting to this life force power that we share with all the energy around us. We're not separate from the energy, except for a tiny little group of cells that defines us as separate from. And so if we have the ability to self heal, I mean, I, I should not be here with the kind of hemorrhage I had, with the damage I had. Uh, I should have been vegetative forever and died, uh, you know, in some reasonable amount of time. And that didn't happen because I got out of the left brain details and I got hooked into this cosmic force of consciousness and said, I am so grateful I'm alive. And whatever I get back, I get back. Whatever I don't get back, I don't get back but I need to go to sleep. So I went to sleep and a lot of healing happens when we sleep and my mother fed me and she fed me things that were good nutritionally and, and you know, and boom, 25 years later, this is what I'm still doing. Incredible. So Jill, uh, you're a big believer in sleeping. Uh, oh. and I am also, but what, yes. what, what, um, when you dream, yes. what, what, which of your characters is dreaming, do you think? I think that, that the, the whole brain is dreaming i think that dream so when i lost my left hemisphere my dreams were not story there was no capacity for story the left brain is the storyteller and the left brain is designed by its nature to take this piece of data uh mel is a male and this piece of data mel wears glasses now with that information i could spin all kinds of things you know that may or may not be true at all and and but the left brain takes its date its details and says this is real this is reality but it's it's taken out of context so we don't know why you wear glasses you might wear glasses because otherwise you're you the, it helps with the way that your eyes reflect or you look the you look more mature or whatever reason you might be wearing glasses but that's the bigger picture but that left brain just wants that piece of story so so it's just designed to make up stuff and to hold on to what it believes to be true so it creates our belief system based on the data but the data has may have many different interpretations okay so um now i want to take you to uh, music because in in your book you don't write too much about music. I, I have to uh, assume, I know you were you were a musician. Yeah. And I guess you don't play too much music these days because otherwise there would be more pages about music in your I book. got my little guitar right here, what do you mean? Uh, okay, go for it. Yeah! No, I'm not gonna sing for you, but yeah, no, music, music is very important to Jill, me. Every, everybody sings on this show. Everybody sings? Yes. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, um, wait, wait, uh, it's gonna take a moment. You gotta give me the moment. Um, no. See, it's all in there. It's all in the right brain. It's not in the left brain. Do you, do you want to play that chord and I will sing you a song? What? Play that okay. C major. Okay, go. When I was just a little boy or girl, I asked my mommy, what would I G? G? G, G, G. G. Will I be character one? Will I character be character one. two? Here's what she said <laughs> to me. Okay, so you right. know, I, I read your book. It would be actually character four, case or else rough. And and, and and I love I, I, I love your book because <laughs> yeah. there's so much to ponder. Yes. You know, and I don't think that you wrote the book to say, you know, I'm I'm right. Um no. I I know everything. It's just no. it's a, a, a concept yes. that it's like throwing a tennis ball a hundred yeah. yards up in the air for me. You know, all I did was I take I took 
I took what we understand about us from a psychological paradigm, um, really, um, and it, 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 it didn't come from Carl Jung, but it landed on Carl yeah. Jung. <laughs> you know, Carl Jung's got these four archetypes. Well, one of them, character one is conscious, the rational conscious brain. Character two, the shadow, is supposed to be unconscious, but it doesn't have to be. I know, I know when I run into somebody and they're worrying or they're complaining or they're blaming or they're throwing a temper tantrum like that, they were in their character two, it's okay. Um, and, and then character three is the anima animus, which is the androgynous self. Um, so it's, it's, and, and it is part of the right brain, which is not me, the individual. So it doesn't have my, my gender identity. So it's would naturally that, and then character four is the true self, which is, uh, the character four of gratitude and grace and, and our connection to something that might be greater than us. So all I'm saying is let's take what we believe to be true and stick it in the brain. And that's all I'm doing is I'm saying neuroanatomically, we have two groups of cells that do emotion. They result in very specific subsets of, of abilities and, and just stick it in the brain where it belongs and then go from there. So you're absolutely right. It's I, I, uh, my contribution is really very small, but very interesting. I, 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 it is, it's intriguing, you see. Your contribution is making people all around the world, like me, more conscious of what we weren't conscious about. Yes. And, and and just to give you an example, this morning, <laughs> I, I was doing something with my character one, uh, writing something to somebody, and my wife came in with a cup of coffee because she loves me, and I growled at her because she'd taken me out of my character one. <laughs> and I said, can't you see I'm busy? And she says, well, exactly. I, that was my like, petula, petula get, character nice two. Yeah. She says, all I'm doing is bring you a cup of coffee. She says, yeah, yeah, but I was working on something. Exactly. You, well, said, you broke my chain of thought. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and then I said, oh. That's and then what I, did she do? Did she did she just stay in her, her I'm being nice to you, or did she go tissy into her too? No, she because she knows me, so she stood her ground a bit. <laughs> and then I, I understood that I had gone from character one into character two. Just like I that. I better invoke character three before I got into deep <laughs> shit. That's exactly right. Yeah, no, that is exactly right. The awareness that comes with this leaves us so much more compassionate with self and with others. Yeah. And isn't and, that, for me, that's the ultimate goal. How do and, we fun, become our more compassionate self? And, and you were hilarious back in Edinburgh. And you said that. You say, you know, if, if you're at work, don't take phone calls from, from your kids or your wife because you're going to bark at them. Yeah, you know, pay it to, and or they're going to call and they're going to say, I call my character one Helen. And my friends will actually say, uh, you know, Helen answers the phone. It's like, hello. And hello, you know, it's not like it's well, well, any other characters. Hello. And they know immediately, oh, I got Helen. Helen, can you call us back later? And it's like, yeah, I'll make a note, right? Because I'm busy over here and I need to make the note because. I was busy over here and now you want me to stick a new detail in there. I'm going to make a note. And that's why ones do lists because they've got to keep the to-do list running and they're somewhere else, you know, their minds are, are somewhere else. So, and that's the ultimate goal is, is how do we recognize these four characters inside of ourselves? What are our patterns? Give them these identities names, get to know the four characters and those you love. Have you talked to your wife about this? Do you know her four characters? Does she know her four characters? I, well, I, I, she knows that I'm interviewing you. So yes. um, I'm going to force her to watch this. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and, and the, no, she knows that I got back from Edinburgh. I said, wow, like Ted was fun and it was great. And I heard this one talk that's life changing. Good. And I got to have coffee. I love it. With Jill. And that was incredible. Um, and and, um, be, be, and and so we haven't talked about there's a, there's so many things we haven't talked about, um, but uh, <laughs> I want to talk about one thing before we go, and, yeah. and I want to mention again whole brain living your new book. Thank you. That, that's why we're here to celebrate it, and uh, I've read it and I, I, I highly recommend it. 
um, the uh, the brain huddle. Yeah. So without going into the brain huddle, in your book, um, you spend a lot of uh, effort trying to persuade people to bring together, yes. you know, to breathe and, 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 and to and to get the, well, for me, three out of four, because character four, who knows where he is, um, to bring So the, Mel, Mel, have you stood on, on a mountaintop and just felt your whole self expand with gratitude? No, but I want to get, <laughs> no, I haven't, but I, I want to get there because I want yes. to challenge you with two questions. Okay, the I first, love it. The, the first is what you know, Michael Mika Chicken. Yes. This, this famous guy, whose name yeah. is like uh, Superman, Mr. Mixelpix. Um, he talks about being in the zone. Yeah, the flow. Yeah. What what character? Yeah, thank you. What character is in the flow? Is, is that a huddle? Are all the characters together? Because I, I can get, when I get into the flow. Wow, that's wow. I think the flow is definitely right brain, um, and but I think it depends on what your intention is, what you're doing, if you're doing, um, if you're doing something actively, I think it's character three, um, because it's the creative and innovative and put it together and time flies by and, and I'm not managing, dealing with the judgment of that, that left brain of right, wrong, good, bad, I'm just doing it and being it. Um, I think, though, that, that, you know, the experience of feeling at one with all that is, is a beautiful experience that people strive for. So uh, meditation, prayer, um, really feeling like, like the quiet, what, what happens is, is it's not like this, this right brain lights up, it's like the left brain quiets down. And, you know, when we do a rosary, we're doing a repetitive. When we're doing a, a mantra, we're repeating a, a and, and if, my, if my left brain language center is busy talking a mantra, then all those others, oh, I didn't do this this morning. Oh, I got to remember to do that later. All those details, they get go to the background. And then what happens is, is, uh, something emerges. I kind of emerge my consciousness away from that level of vibration of, of buzz and busy, 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 or worry, worry, worry. And I shift into the present. And as I'm in the present, then when I really allow myself to become the breeze that is moving the leaves, and the other day I was, I, was, um, I was on the back of my boat and I looked up at the trees and there were these three little clumps of leaves and they were all just kind of wiggling. And I looked at them and they were like little characters up there. And it was like, it was like, like shifting away from me into being the energy that is wiggling those leaves. And it literally made me giggle because it was so cute. It was like these little cute, and it was just like, it was like the universe saying, saying tickle, tickle, and, and I, I became that glee. So um, yeah, there's, you know, just billions and billions of dollars in the market of trying to help people get out of their characters one and two. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think I'm happiest when I'm in three. Oh um, yeah, three's your joy. Three's my my children books. Yeah, um, it's a possibility. You, you're you gonna know, have so you're gonna have so much fun writing for children. Wow. Oh, it's gonna be a blast. I'm jealous. Um, and uh, so so finally, but my my nirvana. Um, I was once asked by a psychologist, when when are you? Yes. Out, out of, uh, not not competitive. When are you yes. just at, at one with everything? Yeah. And that that's when I'm playing jazz with other musicians. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. But you know, the interesting thing to me about jazz is that jazz is like um, a little, a little ditty, right? And then another little ditty, and you know, your little ditties, right? And so here I am, I'm struggling trying to find because I've got all these little ditties. And now I got to fit the right ditty, the right chord formation to the song that I want to sing. Now I could have sung a lot of songs to you in key of C, but the one I wanted to sing to you, I think was in starts with D minor. Ah. And so my brain was struggling to make that connection. But when you do little licks, these little licks in jazz, it's the formation of how they're all going to go together. 
And so I always said, people say to me, Jill, how is it you are such a good public speaker? And I said, well, I'm kind of like a jazz, a jazz player because I know my material and I have like a thousand little pieces of information. Those are your little licks. Now, how they're gonna come out with this particular audience is going to be unique to this particular audience based on what I get back from the audience. Yeah, so that, that, that's exactly what jazz is, you see? Exactly. Jazz, for me, it isn't jazz if you're not having a conversation yes. with the other musicians. Exactly, the exactly. That's exactly right. And that's what good public speaking is. Good public speaking isn't just getting up and doing some shtick. It's about saying something and caring about the response and then playing off of the response. So as a public speaker, my kind of public speaker, I have to be in the present moment. I have to be in my right brain character three in order to do this magical dance. Otherwise I come in as a character one, I can still have the PowerPoint of my character one to keep me on track so that I do make it from the beginning to the end, because there is a beginning and an end, but it, it doesn't dominate. And that's where I'm gonna take you back to music because with the left brain comes in and learns all the notes and learns all the appropriate and learns all those licks and learns, puts those pieces. So, but for performance, you have to, for magical performance, you gotta be in the present moment and you have to bring the experience and the feeling of the present moment into that experience. And my, yes. guess, my guess is that that's true with, with prayer. Because because if if you're going if you're Hebrew are you Hebrew? I'm Jewish. Okay, you're Jewish, right? Okay, right, right, right. My bad. You could, no, no, you could say Hebrew. Yeah. Well, you the language is Hebrew. Yes. Yeah. So, no, no, so I, grew, I grew up in Canada. I live in Israel. So. But but when you're in prayer, when you're in your structured organized organized religion, you have these prayers. Yeah. But, but you can either just do a rote memorization of the prayer, but I know that's not the way they come out. Their inflection and the notes, I mean, it's a song of how a prayer is done at a bar mitzvah anyway. I've been to one or two of those. So, so you know, but if it's, so, so there's that magic. And I'm sure that there are certain voices, certain people who people love to go and hear the prayers by that person because they're magical. You know, they bring the magic you, in. You, you just gave me boost, goosebumps. Love it. Boost gumps. Boost you, gumps? You, you gave me boost You gotta gumps. love the boost gump. Yeah. And, and that was because you see prayer. Yes. The, the, the most evocative prayer is very often music. Yes. You know, we, yes. Have like, we have Yom Kippur in two days, and there's this song, you know, that I'm, I don't go to synagogue, but I'm, I'm wandering around with these prayer mantras, especially this tune. Uh-huh. And um, so, you know, I aspire to have a character four. Yes. I'm not, I'm not gonna do meditation, but I think yes. that maybe he or she or them reveal themselves. Yes. In, somehow in music, when I have this musical nirvana. Yeah, I think so. This is Bella. That, she was singing to Bella, Yeah, Hi, Bella, I'm Mella. So that, that's when I feel at one with the universe. Yes. To the extent where very often when I'm playing, I have to shut my eyes. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, that's why for me, on demand to sing a song, it's like, it's all in here. I'm not a musical performer. I, my music is all personal. And so for me to get it from that right brain into the left brain structure of, oh my gosh, now I got to put this note with this, but I want that song, you know, because I want that message because the song is a message. And, and I didn't want my, my C's and I usually play in C. So that's why I automatically went to C, but but yeah, so anyway, but yeah, no, the brain is this, this amazing thing. And right. the more we explore it, the better we get to know ours, then the more I think fulfilled as a human being we can become. Absolutely. So, so um, last, last question. 
Yeah. Uh, one of the things that struck me in the book, among many things, was the song Que Sera Sera. Yes. Which, which is what I sang for you, which yes. has a special meaning in your life. Yes. To all the characters? Character four. To character four. Character it, four. Que Sera Sera. Whatever will be, will be. The future is not ours to see. Que Sera Sera. I mean, that is as character four as it, it, I mean, think about it, Mel, we can hook into our left brain and we can say, I can have so much fear of what's going to happen in the next five minutes, but I just lost the beauty of the present moment in my fear of the future, which may or may not happen based on my character one in its storytelling and in my character two fear base. I don't want to ruin my present moment. Life is this magnificent collection of moments. And if I have some say in how much love or how much joy I experience, those things happen in the present. But I can get, you know, how many of us actually spend time in the present? So many of us are in the past. We do know where on the planet you live. And so much fear of the future. I mean, there's so much hostility. There's a million reasons for me to, to bring my hate or my distrust or my dislike or my feeling that that I wasn't treated fairly, or I can choose to come to the present moment and say, here is my love. And ultimately, Mel, our number one job as living beings, whether I'm a single celled microbe or I'm 50 trillion molecular geniuses as one human being, our number one job is to love one another. That's all. Jill, now, my love doesn't come with you have to do this and you have to do that. It's just I love you, Mel. I'm so glad I know you. You live on the other side of the planet from me. You're very different from me in so many ways, but the most important ways, we're the same. We are human. We are connected to one another. Our right brains want to play and create together, and we can be love. And Jill, I will always be there for you. Thank you, my friend. I, I know I, you will. I, I'm going to do something now that I wasn't going to do. Okay. I'm like, I'm going to phone somebody and sort out something that my character two doesn't want to deal with. I, isn't that, isn't that love? And I will, I will, I will write you the story. So listen, this it. has been incredible. Uh, one of the most incredible 47 minutes I've spent in my life Thank with you, Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor, who is celebrating her new book. I am. Whole Brain Living, the anatomy of choice, and the four characters that drive our life. Jill, thank you, dear. Thank you, Mel. Big love. Big love. Big love.